Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined, as always, by my trusted colleague, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you once again from disparate locations at Lambeau Field because, Wes, apparently Cincinnati sirens and raindrops were not enough to convince the powers that be that we really need to be <laughs> back in the studio together to shoot this show the old-fashioned way. So we're still going with this way for a little while longer i, I kid of course but uh, i actually um, thought this was i thought this was your doing i thought you didn't like the joke i made about <laughs> you running from the law and we're like okay i, I tried it being next to him again I, I want no part of this yeah okay well we've uh all jokes aside we have a lot of ground to cover on this show Wes, because a lot has happened since we did speak last from the queen city as they call it. And uh, the Packers played their preseason opener on Friday night in Cincinnati. And the starters got a little bit of action. We saw quarterback Jordan love miss a third down pass on the opening series, then directed a touchdown drive, finishing it with a scoring pass to Romeo Dobbs on the second series. Um, If you have any thoughts on that, I will take them, but also there's a lot to talk about in terms of the rookies that shined in this preseason game, whether you're talking Sean Clifford, Emmanuel Wilson, Carrington Valentine, I'll turn it over to you wide open for you. You can start wherever you want. I I like how you said that too. Like, if you have any thoughts, I'll take them. Like it's uh, the village of Swamico, like town, (laughs) like the, the, the meeting here. If you have any issues with your sewer and water bill, uh, no, Hey, the thing I liked about it and a lot of people in inbox have said it this week, Mike, it was probably, it felt more like a regular season game than a preseason game. And it's been a long time since it's felt like that the exhibition season. Now I think a big part of that is the fact you actually did see some of the starters in the first two series, uh, specifically on offense, Jordan love getting to go down the field leads that touchdown producing drive. I thought Romeo Dobbs looked really sharp. You saw the the beauty of Dobbs and Christian Watson together, the amount of attention that that Watson draws on his man beater. And then you have Romeo Dobbs coming free and love just puts a nice, beautiful touch pass on Dobbs for the touchdown. So that was such a good start. I felt like a good continuation of some of those two minute drives that we've seen with the Packers offense And all in all, I think it was really positive. But what really surprised me the most about this game in particular is the fact that you saw so many young guys on both sides of the ball and even on special teams with Samori Toure's big return, guys just stepping up and and making the most of their moment. You obviously had to edit inbox when I wrote this, but the Packers scored 36 points in the preseason. That was more than any other team in the first week. But I also drew that 2013 preseason where the Packers scored 37 points total in four games. It's not always, again, it's preseason. It's, it's everybody, you know, vanilla defenses and all that, but it's not like everybody just puts up a ton of points and a ton of production. It can be really hard for offenses to move the ball when their first team starters are not in there, but Sean Clifford battled. You saw Emmanuel Wilson in an inspirational, emotional night for him having 111 yards, two touchdowns on just six carries. Um, a number of guys stepped up in this game. And to me, that was the most encouraging thing of all is that these young players that the Green Bay Packers have invested into, I thought they got off to a really strong start. Yeah, I thought so too. I mean, and and we're seeing potentially some, you know, as we see in any training camp, we see some shifting going on. You mentioned Emmanuel Wilson. It was the 14th anniversary of um, his father's death at, at a very young age emotional night for for him and his family and you know, he rips off the one touchdown run in the red zone looked really good hit the hole sharp well then later on he takes one 80 yards to the house gets a couple of nice blocks and off he goes showing off a little bit of uh speed that we hadn't necessarily seen on the practice field at this point and you know I'll be honest Wes I wrote a story a couple of weeks ago about the battle for the number three running back position I really didn't think Emmanuel Wilson was was necessarily up there with those other guys and I'm talking about Patrick Taylor and um, Tyler Goodson and then the draft pick Lou Nichols but Nichols has been injured Tyler Goodson injured his shoulder in the Cincinnati game and then Emmanuel Wilson goes off and has this tremendous performance now he still has a lot to learn in terms of the pass protection and those things. That's always the toughest thing for a rookie running back to, uh, to learn and to get up to speed, but he threw himself right into the middle of that, that competition for the third running back when it kind of felt like he was maybe on the outside looking in before. Yeah, Mike. And that is where 
you always see these young guys that you have to make a big impression. You have to have that breakthrough moment before you can start building on everything else because goodness knows, I mean, Emmanuel Wilson could be completely refined as a pass protector. He could make some nice plays with catching the ball, but if you don't run and you don't have those big moments, it's going to be hard to get noticed. This young man got himself noticed and such an interesting story. He has obviously, as you mentioned, losing his father 14 years ago, but he goes to a division two schools, division two school at Fort Valley state. And this is one of these situations where, you know, he goes out for the draft, doesn't get picked, was incredibly productive in college, but it's hard to get noticed. Sometimes he has a cup of coffee with Denver. Then he ends up in green Bay as sort of that. Okay. We need an extra back in this equation, right? Well, a couple injuries happen and you see how quickly that injury can lead to opportunity. I don't have all the statistics in front of me. It's very hard to find preseason stats pre 2000, at least over the last 23 years. That is the longest rushing touchdown, longest run at all the Packers have had in a preseason game in 23 years. The next closest was Whisper Goodman, and it was not even 60. It was 56 yards. It just shows you how incredible it was, both the the block that Rasheed Walker threw on that play and the ability of Emmanuel Wilson to really go and capture that moment afterwards and take it to the house. As he said, he was even saying, you know, the coaches, they're not going to let me live that down if I let the defensive back catch me there. I had to get to the end zone. He did it on that play. He's going to have to build on it, but the kid has the yeah. right mentality. The first thing that he said right after the game was, I got to come back on Sunday and I got to do these type of things again. And every moment that he's had so far, I think the young man has taken advantage of it. Yeah, well, the other big rookie standout on offense was, was of course, the fifth-round draft pick at quarterback, Sean Clifford. And I tell you, Wes, I, I couldn't have been I couldn't have been more excited, interested, intrigued by just watching how this young man played because I've been doing this a long time. I know you've been doing this a long time too. We have seen countless times rookie quarterbacks getting into their first preseason action and they immediately morph into check down Charlie, right? Every single, every pass play is okay. Nothing's there. And, you know, it's either take off and run or find the, uh, find the outlet, you know, find the check down yep. and, you know, just try not to have a negative play. That's not how Sean Clifford went about this. Now he did throw two interceptions. One of them was a pick six that was very avoidable. The other one was he kind of actually threw a 50, 50 ball over the middle that uh, he was hoping Tucker craft would be able to fight for and maybe pull in for a reception. The defender was able to get it away. Those, those are mistakes that, uh, that he'll certainly learn from, but he did not hold back whatsoever. I absolutely loved watching this young man ab absolutely let it rip out there he he played with no fear he practically played with no conscience almost um <laughs> with the, the but 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 that's what you love to see i mean yeah. how is how is a young quarterback going to learn if he doesn't just let the offense work for him try to find the windows that are there, try to fit the ball in the windows and see what happens. And, you know, whether you're talking about the slant pass to uh, Dontavian Wicks that was late, late in the first half that got him down there with a chance to score in the two minute drill before halftime, or when he scrambled out to the left and, you know, didn't just dump the ball off, but threw a 25 yard pass downfield right on a dime to Samari Toure over by the boundary to create a, a big gain out of an extended play. Yeah. Um, you have to like what you saw from uh, from Sean Clifford in this game. And he gave himself off of just one preseason game. He gave himself so much to build on as he now gets more action in these next two preseason games, getting ready to be Jordan Love's backup for the regular season. Sean has not been perfect. And he was even saying afterwards, he's like, I've made a mistake before I've made several mistakes before. I'm not afraid to make another mistake, but I love that mentality, man, because, yeah. you know, I understand there were some people that were questioning, okay, when the Packers trade, you know, draft him in the fifth round, you know, is this guy a fifth round pick? Is he a priority free agent? All these questions, but it's taken us what, Mike, less than four months to understand why Penn state loved this kid so much. Why James Franklin and the coaches there like this kid. Because he competes and he's not afraid of the moment and he's willing to do whatever it takes to win a football game. When you were talking about the resiliency piece, right? The guy led four scoring drives. He led them down, was passing the ball really well, starts very fast. Then he does get, was going to be a sack. He ends up throwing the pick six and he comes back and has another interception. He could have let all those moments bury him. Instead, yeah. he leads a two minute drive after, I believe it 
that was Carrington's interception, correct? I don't have the, yeah. the game book. Yeah, tournament. Valentine Valentine got the interception off the deflected pass, and then and so gave right Clifford get, gave Clifford one more shot before halftime to uh, to erase what had happened earlier, and he went out and took advantage of it. And the one thing that I think has been the biggest strength of Sean Clifford in the practices I've watched going back to the offseason program. The guy has been exceptional in the two minute. Now he doesn't win every single time he's going up against the defense, but he moves the football man. And I felt like that was another exemplary example of that being able to actually lead them down the stretch. He, then he plays at the third quarter, which kind of surprised me a little bit, but 26 passes, 20 completions. I believe it was 208 yards, 204 yards. And then having that Mike, you and I, as you said, it's not just the Green Bay Packers, all these preseason games we've covered over the years. Doesn't even matter if you're a rookie. Sometimes it's QB two, three, four could be a couple of years in the league. Guys don't want to make mistakes in the preseason. They want to be, they want to be perfect. Right. And that leads to just playing very generic, bland football. Sean Clifford was not doing that. And why does that matter, Mike? Because he was giving his receivers a chance to make plays. Yeah. He was given Dontavian wicks to show, Hey, if the quarterback threads the needle to me and I got the safety bearing down on me and I have a guy that's going to be on me on slant, I'm still going to catch that ball and I'm going to turn up field and take it for 42 yards or 47 yards, whatever it was. Jaden Reed, how much did the Green Bay Packers learn about Jaden Reed in this game from being able to take some snaps with, with both Jordan Love and Sean Clifford? These young receivers, and there's been a multitude of them, Mike. Malik Heath had, his, had a reception, I think, on his first play that he played in that game. You need a quarterback to give his receivers that opportunity. Sean Clifford did that. I felt like when the Green Bay Packers left Cincinnati, when you talk about teaching tape, when you talk about the film room, this young man gave the Green Bay Packers coaches a lot to work off of as they prepare now for these joint practices with the New England Patriots. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a couple other guys who carried over what we've seen as some very productive play on the practice field, and they took it into the preseason game. We already mentioned Carrington Valentine. We've already talked about him a lot. Um, rookie seventh round pick out of Kentucky showing that he belongs. He's already been, you know, he, he basically is playing as a starting cornerback when Jair Alexander is not in the lineup and he gets an interception in the Bengals game. He breaks up a couple other pa passes. He had a, a very acrobatic type of tackle on an outside running play um, just showed that, that he's everywhere. He's got a nose for the ball and, and much like Clifford, He's just a competitor down in and down out. And another guy too, and you, you already brought him up, Malik Heath. He undrafted player out of Old Miss, wide receiver guy. He's got nice, nice size to him and everything. And he's out here trying to prove like, hey, I should have been drafted just like, you know, how however many dozens of receivers were were taken in that April draft. He makes, uh, I believe it was either two, had two, either two or three, I think it was three receptions, 36 yards maybe um, in the game. One of those was really nice where he essentially ran a, a comeback route and he came strong back to the ball to, uh, to, to provide the target and get separation from the defender. And then, of course, we also saw him in the blocking part of things, just take a, uh, take a Cincinnati um cornerback and uh as as one inbox reader said pulled a michael Orr and you know shoved took him to the bus like you know outside of the field he took him into the kicking net um yeah. over there on uh, on the packers sideline but uh and hey matt lafleur has brought it up that uh that yeah there needs to be a, another receiver who takes on that sort of goon role and does all that dirty work that al Lazard used to do in the receiving core and malik heath is like hey if that uh if that can be me i'm all for it sign me up yeah and he it's actually funny too because he when i was talking with him in locker room he mentioned i mean that was kind of his game at old miss too i mean he did that type of stuff in college it's not like he was just a moment where he's like okay i feel like i gotta step up and i gotta block this guy and show really good for the coaches. No, that he feels like that's a natural organic part of his game. And he wants to show that. And obviously Sean Clifford, other than the, I think maybe the linebacker that was coming near him at the end of the play, nobody was near him. I mean, it wasn't that Malik. He just blocked his guy. He cleared out the only potential guy that could have converged on him within maybe two or three <laughs> yards of the line of scrimmage. And again, as you said, as he said, he was able to take him over to the cooler, you know, on that play. <laughs> Here's Andy Andy drew an unnecessary roughness penalty because the guy got so mad about getting yeah. blocked, you know, so far out of bounds that he, uh, you know, he struck back at Heath and then the referee threw the flag and the Packers got some extra yardage out well, of it uh, to boot. And somebody said an in inbox like, oh, they got to be careful with that. That, you know, that could be an offsetting. Penalty. No, man, that's an extension. This isn't about a guy going out of bounds and then coming back inbounds on a punt coverage to, to tackle the guy. 
if you wipe your guy out to the sideline, that's an extension of the play. You don't yeah. stop blocking him because you blocked him out of bounds. It's just, it's, that's where you put the guy. So it just so happens that the play lasted long enough that he kept bringing them and bringing them and bringing them. <laughs> but here's the thing. Malik Heath doesn't have Alan Lazard size, but when I look at the overall things that made Lazard successful as an undrafted free agent, as a guy that actually was going to, to succeed in the NFL, he has a lot of those qualifiers to him. And that's what I like about this entire room. Samori Toure, I thought had a really good, strong game. Again, he muffed a punt or a muffed a kickoff early on, but then came back and had that big kickoff return for the offense to get them at midfield. But the thing about it is I feel like all these guys, when you talk about Carrington Valentine too, they are making other people they've they're rising the game of those around them i thought shamar john charles has had some really strong practices Corey ballantine was contributing you know before his stinger injury that's the key in the preseason is when you have young guys or maybe an undrafted free agent that kind of balls out a little bit that makes everybody else in the room kind of take notice a little bit that mm -hmm. hey i i gotta raise my level to this to these guys as well when it comes down to it, Mike, I, I said this about the Packers defensive line too. I mean, injuries can happen. We're still two weeks away from when the Packers have to start even thinking about their 53 man roster, but the Green Bay Packers have a lot of tough decisions looming because I think the amount of people that have stepped up throughout the course of the off season program and many of whom have now carried it into training camp. Yeah. And tough decisions is what they want. If the, uh, if the roster cut down to 53 is easy, then you probably don't have as, as deep and, and talented a team as you would like to have one last note on the game. The Packers don't make it a practice, not a regular practice of giving out game balls during yeah. preseason games, but Matt LaFleur took uh, the time to recognize, especially Kenneth Odomegwu, the Nigerian player of Nigerian descent. He's the Packers international pathway program player who literally on Friday night in Cincinnati, when he stepped on the field was playing a football game for the first time, all he had done was practice and learn and sit in the classroom and do drills. And, you know, he had not played an act in an actual game, a competitive game of football until that preseason opener on Friday night, the Packers honored, Otomegu with a game ball. And uh, it sounded like it was a, it was a pretty raucous celebration in the locker room for the young man. Yeah. And if you heard what Matt LaFleur said at his press conference on Monday, just saying, I mean, he's top tier when it comes to a person and an individual and somebody that is appreciative of the opportunity. Uh, you know, we talked a lot. I even wrote this past week about the team bonding that came out of Cincinnati, but I think there's a certain team bonding element too, that comes out of having a Kenneth Otomegu on your on your 53 or not your 53, but your 90 man off season roster, because yeah. I think it is a good, it goes back to, I think something that Jason Rebervich even said about how having someone like him actually makes him a better coach because it reminds him about the things you can't take for granted when you're working with athletes. And when you're working with people at these positions, because he brings you back to the basics. Right. And Kenneth, I think has had the right mentality since day one, uh, just an incredible um, joy for life in understanding the journey that he's on. And, and I don't know everything that was like for him, you know, back in Nigeria. I remember talking with Andy Malumba when he was here Andy moved to Canada, you know, and I think he was five or six, he was pretty young at that point, but you know, you the people's lived experiences are what make this game great. And when you have somebody like Kenneth, who has been in a different country, you know, even the, the basketball background, just being introduced to different sports and then, watching these things on YouTube and almost kind of getting his first introduction to American football through videos. I mean, it reminds you of just inc how incredible it is that he's even in a position like this now to be in a preseason game. He had to cross Mike. We talked about it in May, but you know, he had to get through the the training camps out there. I mean, when you talk about OC Manura's, you know, camp in London and all these different levels that Kenneth had to get to just to get to Florida. Just yeah. to be in a position that one NFL team would he'd get assigned to go play with them. It wasn't that you just get to Florida and then you're guaranteed to be with an NFL club. That was just getting your foot in the door to potentially getting this opportunity. We talked to him back in May. He had a smile on his face the entire time. You talked to him in the locker room this week. Again, just incredibly appreciative of the opportunity in front of him. And I have to imagine for him personally, 
What a gratifying moment that was. And lastly, I will leave you with this. The interview that Larry McCary did, Larry McCarron did with him that ran in the pregame, the preseason show, him saying that, you know, my goal is I don't want to be the IPP player. I don't want to be a guy that's just, I'm here because I'm an, an exemption. He's like, by the end of this season, I want people to look at me like I'm helping this football team win. And I think when you look at, you know, a player, the first time Packers have ever been a part of this during my time on the beat, uh, just the, the perfect guy I felt like for this locker room and for this football team. Yeah. I loved what he said when, uh, when I had a chance to talk to him in the locker room on Sunday, I believe it was after practice and uh, along those same lines talking about, you know, what his goals are. And he says, my, my goal is after this season for then people to look at me on the football field and ask, what college did you go to? You yeah. know, to ba- basically sort of show that he belongs, that that nobody's going to be able to tell that he got here in any different way than anybody else in America who goes and plays college football and then tries to make uh, make his way into the NFL. I absolutely love that line. I want people to ask me what college I went to, you know, um, that uh, um, and uh, and he says everything, as you noted, Wes, with uh, with a smile on and, his face. So and watch the kid walk past the kid like we have in the locker room. I mean, if you see him out there for any of these preseason games at Lambeau field, he looks like an NFL outside linebacker. <laughs> he does. He just needs to catch up on the rest of it now, which yep. is what he's trying to do with Jason Rebervich and the rest of that room. Lastly, very quick thing. You're not on Instagram. Uh, that's a pity too. I think you'd be really good on that type of social media, but we posted Packers. They posted that video of Kenneth in his interview with Larry. Okay. And, all the players that like that video, Preston Smith, Kenny Clark, Rashawn Gary, all those teammates. I mean, they're in this journey with them. And I think that's the coolest thing. Yeah, it's 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 really cool. The uh, the the way these guys, the way these guys have rallied around a uh, a newcomer, um, not just to, to their team, but a newcomer to the sport in their locker room has been has been pretty cool to see. Um, I want to get to some other things that have happened since we got back from Cincinnati West, but I'll do some sponsor business here first. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes. All paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousin Subs, 50 years of better. I just got to... I just got a follow from cousins on Twitter too. Yeah. Well, and if, uh, and if you want to, uh, if you want to hear something uh, rather humorous, go check out the clip of Kevin Harlan on the Packers preseason television broadcast, reading the, uh, reading the cousin subs um, ad read. And uh, I've been around Kevin long enough that, that man has an appetite. So uh, when he says, <laughs> when he's in the middle, when he's in the middle of uh, the ad read and says to John Kuhn, boy, I'm hungry. Like it absolutely <laughs> did not surprise me. So uh, we, we um, need to have you and Kevin have like an, an ad read off when it comes to these yeah, cousins maybe, reads. Yeah. Maybe that's what we, maybe that's what we have to do. Um, <laughs> well, since we returned from Cincinnati, Wes, um, a few things that have gone on here that I want to touch on one, you are, you brought up, uh, one of the big blocks on Emmanuel Wilson's 80 yard touchdown run in Cincinnati was thrown by Rashid Walker. And in the practices since returning, Rashid Walker has begun to, I guess I would say, share the left tackle spot with the number one offense when David Bakhtiari is not um, taking snaps. Rashid Walker has moved up to where he's sharing that number one left tackle spot with uh, Yash Nyman and the Packers are taking a, a much uh, longer, harder, closer look at last year's seventh round pick from Penn state. Before I say a single word, if you're watching this video, if you're listening to it on, you know, one of your mini podcast options, stop what we're doing right now. Timestamp this, go and watch Larry McCarron's rock report on Walker because the game that he had, Mike, basically every single major play that Green Bay had in the second half, at least, or after the second quarter, it all basically tied back to blocks that Rashid Walker was making, either on the left side of the line or the right side of the line. The thing I love about this kid is the fact that, dude, if you remember this, go back and look at some of those like 2021, like right after the draft, like people projecting what the 22 draft is going to look like. There were people that were saying Rashid Walker was going to be a first round pick. Now that was very premature. It was before any games were played the following college season, but that's the kind of high regard that he was held into. As you talked about with him, some injuries happened. 
He wasn't really even be able to be a full go until the last season started. And he virtually had to redshirt that whole entire year. And when the Packers have 14, 15, 27 different offensive linemen returning this year, <laughs> he kind of gets lost in the laundry a little bit that, hey, you have this guy that was a multi-year starter at Penn State for Sean Clifford, mind you. Yeah. And he's on your roster and he's competing for a spot again this year. And it kind of gets forgotten about. You have Caleb Jones, massive human being, another Big Ten guy. You had Yash Nyman coming back. You have, I mean, Kadeem Telfort is six foot seven, too. I mean, these monsters at this position. And then here comes quietly Rashid Walker back into the conversation, doing it on both sides of the offensive line. Again, wasn't perfect. There were teachable moments, but I thought he got back to showing what he can do. And that is athletic feet and a really strong punch and being able to knock off, you know, edge rushers and get them off balance. That actually plays in pretty well into being a pass protector in this league. And I felt like for him, what an incredible performance to build on. And especially after not playing really all of last season. Yeah, absolutely. He, he, uh, um, as you said, he kind of took a, took a red shirt year because all through the pre-draft process, he was rehabbing from a surgery from the end of his college season. Um, he didn't, you know, didn't really get to uh, get up to speed during the spring to get ready for his rookie training camp. So then his rookie training camp last year was always kind of behind and uh, um, you know, and he's, he's been coached pretty hard by Luke Butkus, the Packers offensive line coach. And, uh, and he was even asked about that in the locker room, you know, all the times that, that, you know, Butkus has kind of, uh, you know, yelled at him and let him have it. He says, Hey, I'm, I'm used to getting coached hard. That's okay. It's all love. These guys just want me to get, these guys want me to get better. They see what, they see what potential I have and they're trying to get it out of me. And, and I think we're starting to, uh, we're starting to see that with Rashid Walker um, practice on Monday. Um, was uh, I guess the uh, the the great visit of the dignitaries um, because uh, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell had uh, stopped in in Green Bay. There was a, a kind of a, a media press event um, discussing the Packers, or I should say, the city of Green Bay, being selected to host the 2025 NFL Draft. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers was here, um, and uh, you got a chance to, uh, to to check that out, Wes. And, and Roger Goodell even came and uh, and watched practice a little bit and yep. reunited with uh, with a guy that uh, he shook hands with five years ago on uh, on the stage of the first round of the NFL draft in Jair Alexander. Those two were chatting it up before uh, practice started on Monday inside the Hudson Center. Yeah, very cool moment. And Evan Siegel got a great photo. We saw the, the backside of the whole conversation. Evan got a great photo of them together from the front angle. And one of those things, I'm sure it happens on a daily basis around the NFL, but I haven't really seen a lot of that where it's like, you know, you see that original, you know, dap and everything that they do on draft night and everyone's really excited but here we are five years later when Jair Alexander has become a legitimate superstar in this league and being able to come back also by the way I don't know who the Packers NFL PA rep is this year it was Mason Crosby but Jair has been an associate rep so he also has some you know things to do with the PA side of things so just an incredible kind of thing to see a guy that went from just a super excited young kid out of Louisville and then now here he is a two-time all pro that's a team leader and former team captain for the Packers. And he's being able to see Roger Goodell again. Unfortunately, I didn't get to have my like reuniting with Roger Goodell at all. Um, <laughs> seeing if he remembered in 2012 when he came to practice the last time in training camp and I badgered him about replacement referees. And if that was a concern at all, one month Maybe. later, I guess it was, um, Maybe you but need yeah. to bring him. Maybe you need to bring him a cousin sub the next time he comes to <laughs> Green Bay. Bring but, uh, bring some lunch for him. But a cool deal though. Uh, before that, because even before practice, I went down for his uh, that ceremony. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers also there. Troy, Troy Streckenbach, the Brown County uh, you know representative, and Mark Murphy all were supposed to be part of an outdoor event. You know, tied around the Packers and in the bike riding thing because of the rain. Practice got moved indoors, so we weren't able to do that. But still. Hearing Goodell talk about the excitement about the Packers getting the NFL draft, Green Bay getting the NFL draft in 2025, and all the work that Mark Murphy put into that from the very day that the NFL announced that they were going to start moving the draft around. Mark was one of the first people to, to contact and reach out to, to, to Roger and say, hey, Green Bay wants this. We're ready for it. We're never going to get a Super Bowl here. We get that. But, I mean, this is the type of event that we can host yeah. eight years later everything comes full circle and, and Goodell very complimentary of the job that, as he said, Murph, we call him Mark 
he called him Murph. I occasionally call him sir. He doesn't like that, but I still do it. Um, <laughs> but but very, very casual with Roger Goodell uh, calling him Murph and just saying that nobody has been a bigger supporter of this community than Mark Murphy. And again, when you're looking three years down the road, as Mark starts to to enter this final stretch of his time as the Packers president CEO, an incredible uh, lasting achievement in addition to the many other things that Mark has done here over the last 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. No question about it. Well, I said we had a lot of ground to cover. There's a couple other things I want to touch on here before we go. I know we're going maybe a little bit long today. That's mostly my fault. No, that's I'm talking that's, a lot. No, it's not your fault. Um, but uh, a couple other players to mention here. One um, rookie seventh round pick at wide receiver Grant Dubose. He has gotten back into practice. He missed all of the OTAs in minicamp and the first stretch of training camp due to a back injury. He is back on the practice field. And as we talk about what's going on at the wide receiver position, we're seeing things from, you know, Malik Heath and Samari Toure and, uh, and Dontavian Wicks and all these young guys that are fighting for a roster spot. Grant DuBose went out at practice on Monday, Wes, and he hauled in, I believe it was four, maybe five receptions in, in 11 on 11. Suddenly number 86 is showing up. And with this week coming up, with the joint practices with the Patriots and then and then the preseason game, the fact that he's cleared now to play, to uh, to take reps in eleven on eleven, he's a he's another young guy to watch here in a, in a competition for those last few roster spots that is far from decided. And I would think he's actually going to play in this Patriots game because he was working his way back, didn't play against Cincinnati. But my goodness, Mike, with him getting in, reintroduced, actually introduced, he never was introduced in the first place. With him being introduced now to these team periods. Grant Dubois has just completely, uh, I, I think, just jumped right out and started making plays right from the get-go. He's he's a guy that when you look at his career at Charlotte, those two seasons that he was there, he was just a magnet to the football. And I don't know if it's just his ability to gain separation. I really don't know a lot about his game at this point, but he's he's constantly around the football. Again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier in the show where we focus so much on the top three if you want to throw a Samori in there, top four receivers, but the Packers have had years where guys come in, they'll, they'll draft guys and they just don't really make plays and it doesn't really work out for them. And, and you got to move on. But I think for the Packers double dipping again and going and getting three receivers again for the second straight year, in addition to having Malik Heath come in, in addition to bringing back Bo Melton, who's made some plays and had some nice blocks. Yep. Yep. The Packers competition has just been revving up over and over again. And when you're talking about a guy like Sean Clifford and Alex Magoo, who I'll imagine will get more snaps, if not against the Patriots, definitely against the Seahawks. Those guys sure. are going out there to throw the football and they have some really talented receivers to work with. And DuBose is added to that. Now I'm, I'm very interested to watch and see where he goes from here. Yeah. And DuBose has such an interesting story because just a couple of years ago, he almost gave up football completely. He was playing at uh, division two miles college, a small school in his home state of Alabama. They, they canceled their season entirely in 2020 due to COVID. And, but instead of completely walking away from the game, he decides to transfer to Charlotte and then, you know, balls out there in North Carolina and ends up being a seventh round draft pick of the Packers. And, and now he's uh, he's thrust himself into um, an opportunity for a, for a roster spot. So the other thing to touch on too, is what's going on at the tight end position with the Packers. Um, a good start preseason wise, I thought for Luke Musgrave and Tucker craft, the two rookie draft picks, but the bad news, Tyler Davis um, went down with a knee injury in the game in Cincinnati, Matt LaFleur, basically all but confirmed that his season is over. The The injury is quite significant. And uh, and I wrote a story on Packers.com that is on the website now as we're talking that, uh, uh, you know, the value of a veteran tight end like Josiah DeGuara has uh, has gone up considerably now with, uh, with the loss of Tyler Davis. And DeGuara is just getting himself back from a calf injury. He didn't play in the preseason game in Cincinnati, but he's back into the uh, 11 on 11 now. He's taking reps with the first team offense. Sometimes he's out there with Musgrave or with Kraft in, in a two tight end set. Um, Josiah DeGuara, I think, is a, is a guy to keep an eye on. For more on him, be sure to check out the story on the website. Yeah, definitely do that. And and the thing about it too, you know, Joe, people forget about this. You know, he originally tore his ACL on a, on a special teams play. I mean, he was contributing not only as that Swiss army knife on offense, but also gave them some flexibility on special teams right off the bat as well. And he's kind of had to catch up a little bit last year, getting back into a rhythm again. Certainly the offense mostly ran through Mercedes Lewis 
and Robert Tunyon at that position, but that job for him is only going to grow in value now. I, I like where Green Bay sits right now when you look at what, I mean, Luke Musgrave looks like a guy that's going to be able to play right off the jump. They have those those 21 packages per, or 12 personnel packages where you have you know Musgrave and DeGuara, you have Musgrave and Kraft when they want to use them both in line. I think both of those right. guys have actually impressed me out of the gate in terms of their blocking um, craft is just a gritty guy that I think is going to get after it. I think Musgrave has proved he's good enough, you know, early on here to build upon that, but that, you know how this game goes, Mike, you need other guys to step up too. Austin Allen, six foot eight, 253 pounds out of Nebraska. This is a huge opportunity for him to show what he can do. And I've really liked Henry Pearson too, the kid from app state who was a tight end at app state. The Packers are labeling him as a fullback six foot two, 249 pounds. But he was the guy that sort of stepped up when Josiah was out in that H back role. All those guys are going to have to find ways to contribute. And especially those, those last two, that's going to be, who's going to be, carrying a bulk of the Packers snaps here in these preseason games moving forward. I think Dre Miller also was repping with the tight ends at practice on Monday. I don't know if that's the long-term plan or if that was just, Hey, we need another guy with those guys to, to get through this practice. But, but certainly the green Bay Packers losing a guy like Tyler Davis, who gives you so much on special teams. In addition to the fact that I thought he was putting together a good camp on offense, had the touchdown right before one quarter earlier, uh, from, from Sean Clifford at the end of the two minute, you hate to see that Davis is a kid that has done all the right things, said all the right things, had a tough preseason last year offensively, but bounced back to lead the Packers and special team snaps sucks for him that a golden opportunity is presented. And unfortunately we know how the sport is and we know how the preseason is ACL injuries, you know, significant knee injuries. They do happen. And unfortunately collected Davis, what a tough kid that dude is though. Right. I mean, the fact that he was able to get up and jog off the field very labored, but still jogged off the field. I think that really speaks to the type of character he has and the way he approaches this game. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, we will call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team. We have the joint practices this week with the New England Patriots. We will have all of it for you on Packers.com. So for Wes, I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody, and we will see you next time.